Aruna. So thank you for making the time. Um, so few others have done like the groundwork for me during this mental health month uh, in Desi Rainbow. Um, and I wonder how many of you got a chance to attend any of those sessions, because that will give me an idea of uh, if I need to add something to tonight's sessions based on what I had planned, aside from uh, what others have spoken. Yeah, uh, but I'll briefly touch upon those points, uh, what they have covered uh, before me. Uh, so for the ones here, you can either participate uh, in chat or by uh, maybe using the emoji options here to say thumbs up and so on uh, for to answer certain questions, whether you want to answer them in voice or video or just chat or the emoji reactions. Um, so how many of you by show of hands or the hand raising function, if you are familiar with that in the participant window, how many of you have previous exposure to any mental health program or mindfulness or meditation of any sort? That you dabble into, dip to your toes in, yeah, yeah. I'm able to see your raised hands on the on the side, as it's in the speaker view. So there, there are a bunch of you. Um, so before I begin, I, I want to acknowledge there's there there's so many traditions of mindfulness and meditation that are out there, and a lot of them they have a spiritual or religious element to them, but there are some that are being uh, created to become like more secular. This is to make them more accessible. So I have a certain uh, agenda for tonight to kind of uh, convey certain things that I wish to convey. So I do have to take help from PowerPoint to keep myself structured. However, I would love to have engagement with you because I, I see this as an interactive session uh, and I'll, I'll speak uh, very shortly about why that is important for today's session in particular. All right. so. Uh, we are going to talk about mindfulness-based stress reduction that uh, we just heard. From the title, for, for the ones who, who probably know this technique, they know what it might be about. But from the title, it looks like some sort of stress reduction. There are so many stress reduction programs out there. But for tonight, what I want to uh, briefly go over uh, is this particular program. And then in order to convey what I want to convey, a few guidelines that I would like to quickly share. Aruna touched upon some of them. So please feel free to ask questions all along anytime uh, during this session, except for the time when we are doing a formal practice and I'll let you know when that is. So muting unmuting is, is a function everybody knows by now with all these online uh, sessions that you have. And uh, usually this particular session and this program is in person like many others, however, uh, we, we are able to create, um, like simulate the in-person experience by doing one of the followings. By participating in today, tonight's session through chat, by texting, to show your presence that you're there, or your voice, your audio only, or if you feel comfortable with your video, um, then talking through your video to participate when there's a chance to participate or ask a question. Um, I do not touch upon this, but uh, it is also very central to MBSR, the program as well, uh, that is confidentiality and uh, encouraging and strengthening trust between the people over here. So what that means is two, way of, two ways of confidentiality. One is um, not to share anything that is being shared here by individuals. You can share anything that I say to you, but if someone is asking or sharing something, from the participant group, do not repeat that outside. Uh, uh, and the second level of confidentiality would be to avoid cross-talking without permission. What that looks like is if someone is a, has asked a question or a comment, and if you want to say something about that, to please ask permission from that person to see if it's okay to ask or comment about what they said. Um, and again, uh, acceptance, non-judgment, inclusion are central to MBSR. Uh, to please keeping an open mind whenever someone asks a question that may sound very simple or very mundane, but it may be coming from their own direct experience. To respect that and to not judge people here and to accept all views which are not offensive so that people feel included. 
Um, now what allows me, Aruna gave a brief out, uh, outline of my experience in mindfulness. Um, but we will briefly touch upon that. Uh, the things that I find are most important to me in my mindfulness practice is my daily practice that I maintain um, on a regular basis. And to deepen my practice, I go to these long silent retreats. They have a way of kind of resetting my, uh, my daily practice and kind of strengthening that more. And I try to learn and get mentored by the scientist mentors in mindfulness-based stress reduction and also the spiritual mentors um, from different traditions. And I'll briefly touch upon that too. And to regularly engage in other teachers in similar programs. Um, and I try to attend like relevant talks. There might be book openings or where the author of some mindfulness research or uh, some certain teacher is going to show up. Uh, my foray into teaching this particular program was at our institute here, our cancer center, where, where I have my primary job based at the Einstein Bold Cancer Center. Uh, and besides that, I also teach meditation in the New York City groups, like Aruna said. Now, why am I doing this? So intention behind something that I do is very important to me. And I, I feel like from others' experience that I've heard is very important as well. So I, I feel a personal commitment towards teaching mindfulness in this particular program. And I have a strong belief that it has a way of allowing people to live their life uh, with meaning and in, in ways that they actually want to. And this particular technique and program, because it is based in science, it gives me a lot of confidence from seeing evidence from past experiences. Uh, just to uh, emphasize, uh, validity of this pro particular program, a mindfulness-based stress re uh, reduction, this is a kind of training a particular teacher or facilitator for MBSR goes through, which uh, spans across uh, roughly three years or maybe longer, depending upon the time that a person has for this training. Without going into details, we'll just look at the colors. So the green ones are the required silent retreat. It's part of the training. Uh, and the purple ones are the training uh, sessions which are nine days or nine weeks uh, from Brown University Medical Center and University of Massachusetts Medical Center. And the blue ones are the actual teaching experience, uh, which is evaluated by Brown. So not to uh, burden you with these, these details, but what is central to this teaching is embodiment, meaning to live what I'm teaching you and to come from knowledge and information about what I'm teaching scientifically, experientially that is peer, peer mentored and mentored by a faculty experience in this. Uh, it's a mental, this is part of a mental health pro, uh, month in Daisy Rainbows. But for tonight's session, I have uh, these particular items that I want to convey to you, uh, which is like a brief history of MBSR and meditation mindfulness. It's a diverse uh, topic to tell you what it means in this particular context. And a couple of research findings that actually show the benefits of this program studied over the past 40 years. And what do you need, what do you actually need to do to derive those benefits that research has uncovered? We'll talk about that very briefly. And to get a taste of the actual experience, a uh, couple of the techniques, a couple of the skills that we learn in this program, and, question and uh, questions and discussions, you're welcome to ask questions along the way, but we'll have time for them more questions towards the end as well. Um, before I go into this, uh, how many people, you can text in the, in the chat box or just raise your physical or blue hands. Um, how many of you do not feel stressed in your regular life? And if I show hands, I'm able to see your windows. I'm scrolling through those just to see. If you have raised your uh, blue, wind, uh, blue hand or your physical hand. All right, I don't see any hands. How many of you feel stressed at least like once a week or maybe every day or more often than you realize? By show of hand, hands. Okay, there's a lot of thumbs ups in their hands and blue hands. Uh, so thank you. This is not to kind of uh, rat you out or out you in terms of your stress but just to, uh, to create solidarity, to show that this is one of the common human experience that we, that most of us 
have on a regular basis. Yeah. And uh, stress, as it is seen, it's all seen in a negative light from what I hear from people. However, there are some um, evolutionary, evolutionary benefits of stress and why it came to be in the first place. So I'll be talking about that uh, during this session. At this point, I also would like to, before I go into more details, I'd like to welcome any of you, if you want to share any of your um, meditation or mindfulness experience or any other stress reduction experience that you had in the past that you feel comfortable sharing at this point. And this can be based in any spirituality, any religion. There are so many ways of doing this. Uh, the purpose of asking you this question is to actually make this more interactional, give, give you some voice and also make you feel at home with what you have practiced before, not to just intimidate you with one particular type of thing. Yeah, so any experience you may have about mindfulness and I want to uh, welcome all sorts of experiences. This is not about uh, sharing how wonderful it was and how it helped you, which is also possible, but it's, what is also possible is that you might have had a very hard time with something that you tried in terms of meditation or stress reduction. Uh, I particularly welcome those experiences as they don't get so much space. Or it could be like, oh, I didn't know it didn't work for me. I don't know why. Anupam, you would like to say something? Yeah, hi. Um, so in my experience, whenever I try to do meditation and, you know, it kind of backfired on me. And, you know, it's like I was so much in touch with the inner turmoil. It kind of ended up hurting me. So what instead I started doing was, you know, some sort of dance routines. So that has been what I do to, you know, deal with my stress. Yeah, this is very important. I'm glad you, you shared this Anupam, uh, because the common belief is that meditation is supposed to help. It does help in a lot of ways, but one has to be very aware and, to, and, and uh, in terms of knowing whether it hurts and how it hurts you and how to modify that into something that works for you particularly, yeah? Uh, this is very central to MBSR. Any other experiences that you'd like to share in terms of mindfulness, stress reduction, meditation of any sort that you may have tried? There are blue hands here. I don't know if they are still for the, the response for stress or they are blue hands for actually sharing your uh, mindfulness experience. So please speak up, unmute yourself and speak up if you'd like to share something or if you want to type in the chat box about your experience, that's also another way of uh, opening up. Um, Tushar, I've used mindfulness basic exercises with um, LGBT youth who experience trauma. And personally, I've used meditation um, myself as a, um, a focusing element and stress reduction. Thank you. Uh, would you like to say your name? Um, my name is Caitlin. Caitlin. Thank you, Caitlin. And uh, some other people have shared. I'll quickly shout out. Uh, Leo says his tries meditation mindfulness through simple music practice. This is also one more way of uh, practicing meditation. Pranayama, Aruna says, uh, for stress reduction. Uh, Suja or Suya. She says, I had experience of not being able to sit in silence in my mind as I practice meditation, taking on all the sounds around me, etc., until I learned that it was okay to allow those sounds and images to enter and let them pass by. Then it was easier to stay on track with connecting with the self. Uh, so I'm really happy that you shared that, Su Suja. Uh, this is another form of meditation to actually be present and take in the sounds that are around you. And staying in silence is not an option for everybody particularly uh, trauma. So trauma-sensitive mindfulness is a very big topic that is uh, central to MBSR. And we make sure that people are not meditating in the way that is triggering trauma. And this is a very good example you gave, Suja, of trying to uh, do sound meditation instead of just plain silent meditation. Uh, Tajinder says, bringing myself to present moment. Yes, that is a central theme of uh, mindfulness. And mantra chanting, yes, this is another one. 
uh, Josh here, who's also joining us tonight. He's he's very experienced in chanting um, and vipassana meditation that I've heard a lot of people are into. And uh, this is another big one. There are a lot of meditation apps that people are using. Um, so I want to briefly say something about that. That's a great resource. There are so many online resources for meditating. Uh, however, there's one catch there, the self-motivation part that is uh, a huge element there because you're completely reliant on, reliant on self-motivation uh, or your alarms or reminders. Uh, so I, I, I take that as a supportive technique of using apps. Uh, but what would help along with that even more take you further is actually joining a physical live group online or perhaps teacher that might be accessible. Uh, Rohini says hearing, hearing in today, trying to meditate more. Yoga and breathing techniques. Anita says, Koshin say, I do meditation almost every day. Uh, meditation app while walking. Yes, this is a form of walking meditation. Uh, Sai says, I'm relatively new to meditation and, and yoga. You can continue to share in the chat and we'll have time to share towards the end too, but I will quickly move further. Um, so this is, this is, uh, this may look a little busy, but I will guide through this. Uh, so it makes more sense and, uh, you can take away a lot of things from here. So this is taken from, uh, John Kabat-Zinn, who's the founder of MBSR, his book, uh, Full Catastrophe Living. This gives a brief overview of the stressors and how they act on us physiologically, psychologically, and what we can do about them. This shows you coping mechanisms of stress at the same time, what triggers or creates stress in you. Uh, so here, uh, imagine this is you, and then there could be external events that are the stressors, which could be, let's say someone yelled at you or someone said something a few weeks ago or 10 years ago that is still ringing in your head and that creates stress in you. The current uh, environmental situation, the health situation, that is a stressor. And there could be many other stressors in personal and social life, professional life, that would be these external stressors. So they have a trigger on our body that works through the cardiovascular system, your heart, musculoskeletal system in form of like muscles tightening during stress, nervous system, uh, immune system getting affected and actually getting weaker. And this particular external stressor events, they trigger internal stress events in the body. And how does that happen? By perception of these uh, stressors by the body and therefore triggering the classic flight or fight uh, activity or system in our body. What that means is when we were an animal living in the forest, uh, we had this response when we saw a tiger or a predator to either fight with that particular animal to survive or to flee to save our life. That is inherent to us. Now there's no tiger that we see unless we go to the zoo, but that tiger does not trigger this response. The tiger in the office who may be our boss or a colleague or the tiger in our family, any family member, that they could be the tiger that triggers this response in us. And how that plays out on our, our body further. Now these may be some scientific terms, but hypothalamus part of the brain, pituitary also uh, around your brain, uh, the adrenals that we know that uh, they trigger the stress hormones uh, that are added to your body. Uh, and then this leads to raising the blood pressure that you probably are familiar with. When someone is stressed or anxious, their pulse rate goes up, uh, their blood pressure goes up, they kind of get activated, the hyper arousal. And then, uh, then that leads to more uh, physiological symptoms, arrhythmia, which means irregular heartbeat or sleep disorders, people not being able to sleep due to stress. So maybe headaches that are triggered due to any stressful situation. Body aches are also phys physiological, physical manifestation of stress and anxiety. And then what happens after that? The body tries to, uh, the body and the mind, they both try to compensate and they try to cope with the stress. However, the ways of coping are not very productive. They are kind of self-destructive. Some people engage in making themselves busy when they are stressed, they overwork, uh, or they engage in a lot of physical activity. They might exercise obs obsessively, uh, or they might overeat, or eat ice cream or things that 
give them pleasure temporarily. Or there, there are people who might engage in different types of substances, drugs, alcohol, caffeine, and so on, and then develop dependency on that. Whenever they get stressed, they eat, feel better, stress, eat, feel better. They get stuck in this negative loop, a habit loop, and then eventually what happens is this cannot go on for long. So there happens, uh, there comes a point for breakdown, like uh, the break, classic breakdown we talk about, which is uh, psychological, physiological exhaustion, then loss of motivation or interest in things or enthusiasm, which is seen as depression <clears throat> that we understand. Uh, not only that, heart attacks are connected to with stress too, as you may be aware of, and many other risk factors are elevated, risk factors factors, for example, for cancer and others. So um, although I'm going to go over this, but what do we do about this? How do we intervene? And how does mindfulness play a role in all this? Where does it intervene? So mindfulness allows us to actually evaluate these thoughts and feelings that are triggered through stress. Yeah. And then therefore, give, bring them to forefront so they could be addressed and something could be done with them. That will also go through our, uh, our brain and our hormonal system, pituitary adrenals, where the stress hormones will go down when we uh, engage in any mindfulness practices. Um, and then they also actually change changes the way our nervous system is triggered or not triggered at the hypothalamus. <clears throat> uh, and then by being aware, the awareness that is created by mindfulness that makes us aware so aware of like these muscles that are being contracted when we are like uh, shrugging our shoulders or we are uh, contracting our muscles like fist and holding our hands together or uh, holding our body, contracting our body, making it small during stress. So one can become aware of that and then there could be a chance to relax that. Um, and then there are a lot of emotion focused strategies in mindfulness, problem focused strategies that would allow the stress to be tackled by different angles, not just by sitting quietly. And that is a huge element of MBSR is about how to integrate your meditation into your regular life in order to bring some equilibrium and homeostasis, to the balance of mind, so to speak. Um, having said that, I'll go over some of these elements today. <clears throat> Uh, but I would like to talk a little bit more about this program, about why this program could be a decent option to actually consider. Before you join the program, it's not like you just sign up and you just join. This is a bi-directional assessment to find out where you are coming from, to understand you as a participant before you join, and to see if this is the right time, are you able to do this uh, particular program right now? So there is a assessment that will be sent to you before you join, where you fill out these confidential questionnaire and then there's interview involved for five to 10 minutes for you to get, get a chance to um, ask about this program, whatever you have, are not able to during the group sessions. So that you are in the process, you also assess me as a facilitator that if you want to spend like eight weeks with me during this program, Now, well-being, uh, well-being or stress reduction, what does that mean to you? I'm trying to be aware of time here. We still have more time. So when you hear this word well-being, what does that mean to you? Now, this is a chance for you to uh, speak up and kind of join everybody and say, what does well-being mean to you? When do you feel, quote unquote, calm and balanced by doing certain activity, what makes you feel happy, calm, and composed and balanced? After you eat ice cream, after you go for a run, what is it that works for you? You can raise your hand or unmute and start speaking if you like. Or even type in the chat box and I can shout it out to everybody. Uh, Levin says eating healthy foods that makes uh, makes him happy, balanced, calm. Let's say you came home from a long day's work, yeah, and you had a very stressful interaction with somebody or a group of people. What is the first thing that you go to when you come back? Uh, some people are saying watching my favorite show, movies, 
Anubham says dancing and volunteering. Sai says for me listening to music. That seems to be a recurring theme for, for a bunch of people. And Tajinda says long breathing exercises that helps uh, calm her down. Uh, chicken wings help uh, helps. Chicken wings and beer helps someone calm down. Celia, yeah. Suja says daily practice of staying sober, watching sci-fi, spending time with uh, my cat. Yeah, cats have a way of soothing people. I've I've been told they are they're called uh, the Zen masters. You know? they're already meditating. Prayer helps Justin to feel calm. Gardening, uh, same thing that I believe with gardening for COVID as well. Favorite show with pizza. Uh, for Veena, it is connecting with loved ones, physical movement, that is dancing, uh, making art, creativity, being in nature, learning plus growing. Playing with my dog. Yeah, dogs are very uh, comforting and soothing. Eating junk food. I'm glad you said that. Uh, and I'll, say, I'll tell you why. Music, the consistent theme. You're also welcome to share your voice, uh, even even if not video. Yeah, watching a Hindi movie uh, that that brings out the balance. Dancing, gardening. So we see like this recurring theme of um, seeing something, doing something that uh, kind of relaxes people, and this can work in different ways uh, by actually distracting you from what's going on or actually processing that. When some people say talking to a friend um, or a loved one, yeah? Sleeping, dancing, art, all these things are coping mechanisms for stress. And uh, you don't have to answer this question, but I want to throw this question out there for you. Uh, let's say you have a recurring theme of stress in your life. This is a hypothetical scenario, maybe real for some people. Did you feel stressed day in and day out? Let's say watching movie is your go-to stress reduction system. How many times can you watch the movie? Do you have time to finish the whole movie to get the full dose of the movie's stress reduction? Uh, gardening, let's say it is snowing outside and you are stressed, what are you going to do then? Walking, same thing, running, walking, what are you going to do then if you're in a colder region? Uh, I'm not saying that this is not good. It's, these are all very helpful strategies, yeah? But I'm, uh, I'm asking you to consider like, how often can you access these stress reduction uh, techniques are you using, yeah? Just to consider, you don't have to answer this right now, but just think this in your head. Uh, and from what I have brought here is uh, kind of the distilled version of what I've heard people say. Uh, for example, the efforts in your life that ensure well-being that a lot of you shared, uh, exercising, walking, going in nature, talking to loved ones. But ultimately what I found uh, it comes down to is people feel well, the sense of well-being they get when they feel balanced emotionally. Yeah, And that balance is the mental and emotional replenishment that is that you get from watching movies, eating ice cream, and so on and the mental and emotional drain that happens due to stressful situation. When there's this balance, when the balance is tipping more towards the replenishment is when people say they feel well, yeah? And one of the big thing that uh, I have heard pe people feel well from is when they get meaning in life. It could be from anything, from any, any hobby, any passion, their regular work, from any activity that gives them meaning that makes them really happy. And the question that I threw in there for you to uh, to say, what would you do when it snows outside? Uh, are you going to be able to go for a run or to walk or to the garden? To ask yourself, how sustainable are your means of stress reduction? Yeah, just to give it a thought. But again, giving you some more uh, overview of this program, the history of MBSR, where did it all start and where is it now? It was started by, uh, a meditator. You probably heard these stories of these Westerners, the quote unquote, the hippies that went to the East and they learned all, all sorts of spiritualities and all sorts of uh, non-conventional skills they learned there, including meditation. Now, all these people from the 70s, they wanted to bring it to their world, to the West. So John Kabat-Zinn was one of those. Uh, however, over the time he trained as a molecular biologist, as a scientist at MIT, 
Uh, and John really wanted to use MBSR as a major public health initiative. He wanted to sh shift the bell curve of humanity towards greater well, uh, greater health, well-being, and wisdom. It's kind of a lofty goal. You might have heard of such goals very frequently, but how realistic is it and how to actually achieve that? That's what he set out to achieve. So what he did is he first started to offer this program to surgery patients. He was working in a medical institution, University of Massachusetts Medical Center. Uh, so he asked the surgical ward to say, uh, to find out if they can use this technique because these patients could not uh, be helped by any other available treatment. No painkillers were working on them. No physiotherapy was working on them. So then the administration said, nothing is working. Your technique is non-invasive. So you might as well try this out on them. This was the first successful program that he ran for people in really uh, chronic pain. This was 1979. And since then, a lot of scientific research in terms of scientific studies and clinical trials have been undertaken on this program for the past 40 years, uh, uncovering a lot of benefits of mindfulness, including uh, the trauma sensitivity of mindfulness, also part of this research. And what John and others have found out through their work uh, is that this particular technique, this program is applicable, now this is a big claim, to any disease state, to ameliorate, to kind of reduce the effects of these chronic conditions, long-standing conditions where recovery may not be option, an option. Some conditions might be terminal, but how to make the lives of these people slightly better or a lot better than it is right now and where they are. So that brings me to uh, like clarifying what is meditation for MBSR. Now, mind you, I mentioned earlier that John Kabat-Zinn or this particular program uh, was trying to make it accessible to a very diverse audience. So it doesn't look like it is rooted in a particular tradition or religion because not everybody is comfortable to learn a technique from another religion if they are a strong believer in something else. So this was made secular. However, I should, uh, as a scientist, I, I, I like to acknowledge the contribution. So I purely look at this as a scientific study, the meditation that even came from Buddhism. So the author in this case was the Buddha and all other uh, Buddhist meditation teachers who actually contributed to the, the techniques that are used in this particular program. However, Buddhism is not practiced in this program. None of the chantings or the references to the, to the stories of Buddhism, none of them are used in this case. Yeah. So meditation in MBSR is a particular way of paying attention. Yeah. And that paying attention is like paying attention to what is happening right now, meaning from second to second not dwelling in the past, not uh, ruminating in the future, but right now. And here is a very important part of that, to not judge whatever you observe right now. Yeah, Whether that is pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, to bring a non-judgmental attitude to what you are able to detect in the present moment in your direct experience. So basically, it helps us learn how our mind and the attention that the mind pays to that operates. And this way, we might have a chance to actually modulate that to our benefit. And contrary to popular belief, a bunch of you actually share that it's hard for you to sit down and meditate in silence. This is not very, very uncommon. A lot of people experience that. So in this case, there's no need to quiet the mind, quote unquote, because I heard from some of my friends, I cannot meditate. I, my mind hardly stays any stable. So when my mind becomes stable, I will meditate. That is not something that you need to worry about. You can come with any state of mind and still be able to do this practice, this program. Uh, so what the intention is of this program is to actually change the relationship that we have with difficulties, with challenges, including diseases that are difficulties and challenges, physical, mental, yeah? So that the way they affect us could be changed. And in this way, to increase a sense of well-being and happiness, what, what that means to you. Uh, it's important to mention what it is. It's not a dogma. You're welcome to it, experiment and try it out for yourself. 
It's not a religious practice uh, for no chanting, no belief system, no propaganda. It is rooted in science in, in a way of like, try if you like and see if it works for you. So what does this even look like, this program? What are you supposed to do? So on a broad level, uh, the way I see is, MBSR is an eight week program that is based in experiential learning. Yeah, meaning from your own direct experience and experience of other, other participants while uh, staying true to the curriculum. And that curriculum involves three major elements to it, uh, which are formal uh, mindfulness practice, the form of my mindful practice practices, they could be sitting uh, and doing silent meditation. It could be uh, a body scan that you lie down on and observe your body. It could also be walking meditation. Yeah. And there are informal ways of uh, doing meditation. The second element of MBSR, which is kind of integrating mindfulness practices or creating mindfulness practices out of your own life. For example, if you're eating, eating mindfully, really paying attention to the food, to chewing, the flavors, the way of lifting it, if you're eating by hands, to see the touch, notice and register the touch. If you're doing chores, brushing your teeth, taking shower, really feeling the water on your body, really feeling the movement, the hold of the brush. These are all mindfulness techniques that could be integrated in many different activities that you do anyways. This way you're not taking out extra time out of your life. Uh, and the third element of MBSR is actually learning the physiology, the neuroscience behind it briefly. How does mindfulness stress connect with our body? The two directional um, pathway that there is. How does the body create manifest stress uh, that, it, that it receives from outside? And how does mindfulness actually intervene uh, in terms of uh, working the mindfulness through your mind and through and towards the body. Both body and mind, they are very central to MBSR practices. And I'll briefly uh, mention what initially was found as benefits of mindfulness that it was known to reduce anxiety, stress, depression, chronic, chronic pain, the perception, including the risk factors for major chronic ailments. I'll I slightly spend a slight, little more time on this uh, further along. But I'll briefly go over two studies. Uh, I'll try to simplify this. So a study in a scientific study, a bunch of you could be are, are already scientists, I know. This could be redund redundant for you. But for the uninitiated, uh, they did studies on, let's say, a couple of groups of people. One group was offered this particular MBSR training, and the other group was the control yeah that we will compare with so in science the control group is important that needs to be something significant if i say the control group is just sleeping and just walking like they want obviously the mbsr group will show better benefit but that will be a biased biased study so in this case the control group was cognitive behavioral therapy which is a very well known uh, treatment modality for stress reduction so when they gave uh, the group of people this particular practice, MBSR, for eight weeks, and these people were suffering from chronic lower back pain to the point that their regular life functions were uh, affected. For example, they could not lift like their coffee mug or they could not lift their child or grand grandchild. Doing regular chores they were not able to do, they were like in, in immense pain. So not only their functionality was impaired, that created extra strain on their mind, extra stress on their mind of feeling unable to do a lot of things that everybody else is able to do or they were able to do. So after the period of eight weeks, and they also some of them also continued on to 26 weeks of this program, not only the perception of the, of the back pain was reduced, the functionality in their regular life in terms of what they could do and that significantly improved in the MBSR group, yeah? Uh, so this is one study. The other study they did on uh, students. Students, they experience a lot of stress during their, uh, their, their school or college or medical school years. So in this case, 10,000 students were surveyed before and after this program to see if their stress is reduced, their well-being is increased. So they use these parameters to measure their stress levels and their general sense of well-being. 
So 90% of these students, they reported a reduction in stress and increase in well-being after this eight-week uh, program. And how do they report this? By, re by reporting reduced perceived stress. The way they perceived stress was reduced and the anxiety levels got down. They were able to regulate themselves emotionally better. Uh, they were able to have compassion and empathy for their peers, for their seniors, their colleagues uh, at work and at home. And this is a big one. Uh, as I teach in, in graduate school here in the medical school, my own students very often report to me that they feel disconnected. They feel like a robot going through their school years and they don't feel like a person. They don't get, they don't get to connect with people. Now that significantly imp has been seen to improve in this particular study. They feel student felt increased sense of community cohesion. They feel, felt like they are connected, they are not alone. And that's a very big uh, outcome of this study. As very briefly I'll mention, there was a 70 year uh, study. Some of my friends, they all heard me say this like thousand times. Howard conducted a study on, uh, on people, 300 and 300 people in each group for seven, 70 years, seven zero. In order to find what makes people happy. One of the top outcomes of that whether a person is from uh, the poor group, the group where there are poor people who did not get a chance to educate themselves financially, uh, not doing well, high crime rate, versus the Harvard elite people in other group. Uh, regardless of which group people are in, the greatest sense of well-being and happiness they received was through connecting with another person on a deeper level. What that means is to be able to share their inner uh, difficulties, challenges, and joys with another person, not just going out to movies and parties and vacation. So that's why community cohesion is a very major factor in the way people feel happy uh, and have a sense of well-being. So to, uh, to kind of list some more benefits of mindfulness, what has been seen through this program is people see um, a decreased perception of pain severity. And therefore, this pain is, not, is comparatively not debilitating them in their regular life functions. Yeah, and it's this is a very common outcome that people uh, report reduced stress, reduced anxiety, reduced depression as a result of this program, going through and practicing this. Um, and then this is a big one. The amount of consumption of anti-anxiety medication, pain medication, it is seen to reduce significantly. Uh, when people go through this program and practice this on a regular basis. Decision-making is one of the major things that is being impaired by stress. And that ability is seen to improve after this program, after regular practice. Medical treatments, now this was, uh, I also talked to medical community. So medical treatments are just as good as someone adhering to it. Like in our context, Let's say we are trying to eat healthy, we are trying to eat green smoothies or taking some helpful supplements and whatnot. We take them for one week, then we forget for a few months and we come back. So the adherence to things that we want to add to our life uh, for our betterment, the adherence to those type of uh, lifestyle changes, they seem to improve as we engage in a mindfulness practice such as this. And also uh, giving up bad habits like smoking, uh, overeating, overworking, all of these maladaptive coping mechanisms. This program helps people to actually uh, slowly begin to uh, give those up. And I just mentioned the increased community cohesion, the improvement in the interpersonal interactions that we have at home, at work, they seem to improve. And also the a sense of belonging in the community. And this is a big one uh, for me as a researcher. There are actually biological changes in the body happening, such as changes in the nervous system, changes in the stress hormones that we have in our body, and enhancement of the immune system has been actually studied as a result of this program that is seen to improve. Now, what does what do you need to do uh, to do this? This is like a blueprint. Uh, it's not exactly happening right now, but the blueprint of what do we need to do to actually get benefits of uh, this particular program. Uh, so without getting you into all this nitty gritty, uh, what I'll do is I'll briefly mention, 
in, in simplistic terms. So eight weeks of two and a half hours per week. Yeah. And then in between these eight weeks, when you're not in the class, you're practicing 45 minutes or an hour per day. This is not like you're not sitting quietly for that an hour. Yeah. There are multiple activities that you will do, like a logging, maintaining a log, or doing one formal practice, meditation practice, and then integrative practices, like I said, observing an activity in your life, um, and so on. This will go on for eight weeks. And there'll be in between these eight weeks, you'll have one full day of mindfulness where you'll, you'll be meditating in silence and doing different mindfulness activities from morning to evening. That is part of the program. Uh, now, how does a typical class look like? What do you do in a two and a half hour session? So what do we do there? We do, we cover these three elements that I mentioned, the formal mindfulness, formal meditation, like sitting and doing silent guided meditation. Uh, and then we'll talk about the integrative practices. Every week we'll have some practices for you to do. Um, the mindful movement is a big part of MBSR where you use yoga as a means of meditation, not as a competitive physical ex exercise. And the third one uh, will discuss your experience that you bring back after applying these techniques to your life. Relating with each other and learning experientially is a big element of that. So your direct experience is kind of woven into this program. So um, I wanted to give you a taste of a couple of these um, techniques, a couple of many techniques that we learn in this program. So if you allow me, I'm being mindful of time, we still have some more. If you allow me, just finding a comfortable way for you to sit. It could be any way for the next few minutes, not for very long. Um, to just sit comfortably. If you feel comfortable closing your eyes, then closing your eyes if you feel like, or you can also maintain a downward gaze to kind of restrict the field of vision and therefore distraction, yeah? Or if it feels comfortable, you can completely keep your eyes open and focus on something directly in front of you, which is not the screen, yeah? And to begin, uh, I'm going to invite the sound of this bell, which might help people to center their attention and bring it to something that I will guide you where you will bring it to. So for now, just sitting comfortably. And if you are able to, allowing your shoulders to relax. And how you can do that is by supporting your hands, placing them in a comfortable spot. On armrest, in your lap, you don't feel strain on them. And uh, if you're sitting on a chair, then allowing your feet to be comfortably placed on, on a surface, yeah? Your legs are not dangling and creating strain for you. And then just focusing on the sound, hearing the sound as long as you can hear it, following it towards an end, its end until it cannot be heard anymore. Beginning by giving yourself choice. The choice to focus on what is most present for you right now. And what's present for you could range from anywhere, from any sounds that are persisting in your environment, the sounds of, let's say, the air, air conditioner or the refrigerator that is persistent, yeah? If that is comfortable. If it is comfortable for you to focus on your breathing, you may do so by trying one of these following. Either focusing on the sensation of the breath that is going through your nostrils, the air, yeah? 
or the rising and falling of your abdomen, your chest, expansion and contraction of your body. This could be means for you to notice your breath. But breath is not always an option for everybody. It may feel uncomfortable. So please allow you to choose a different um, object of focus besides breath. And a different object of focus could be, like I mentioned, sound, or it could also be the contact of your feet to the floor. It could also be the touch of your hands, your hands touching each other, or your hands touching any surface that they are resting on. Or if there's any sensation in your body that is most noticeable, for example, the surface that you're sitting on, that you're able to notice the contact of your body to the supporting surface that could become the object of your focus. Taking care of yourself is extremely important here. And what that means is if you feel overwhelmingly uncomfortable, to end this practice right then and there by opening your eyes and moving. However, if you're able to do this with even slight discomfort, I would welcome you to stay with your practice by focusing on this object of focus that you chose. For example, there could be a lot of restless thoughts that may be coming to your mind. For a couple of moments, for a few seconds, just focusing on those thoughts. What are these thoughts that are coming? Are they staying longer? Are they just passing? And a new thought arises every second. And as much as possible for you, without getting overwhelmed, just noticing whatever arises, whether that is a thought or whether there is an emotion that is arising in you or any body sensation arising in you. Just noticing the nature of the sensation, if there's a sensation noticing, whether that is pulsating, whether that is throbbing, whether that is numbness or a sensation of pressure, or there's tingling or itchiness. But making sure that you, know, you do not judge any of these observations, including not judging the type of thoughts that are coming to your mind or the emotions that are you experiencing. Just noticing that this is an emotion right now and it's okay. This is a sensation right now and that is okay. The thought has come up in my mind and that's okay, whatever thought that is. But the practice is to come back after you notice and acknowledge what has come up to return back to what you have chosen as the object of your focus breath sensation, hand, hands, feet, your, your sitting surface, or the sounds. So returning back to this object of focus is the exercise for this particular practice. If breathing is comfortable to you, <clears throat> perhaps taking slightly longer breaths, not very long, just slightly longer than your normal breathing. And sometimes that helps the mind to focus on the breathing. Doing that for like five to 10, maybe 20 breaths, so that feels comfortable to you. And then coming to the sensation that you chose to focus on, the object of focus that you chose Self-care is very important here. At the same time, being accountable to your practice, for example, by not moving when there's a strong urge to move, like just stay with that <clears throat> for a few seconds, for two, three, five, maybe 10 seconds. To make this resolve of, okay, I will wait for 10 seconds. And then if it becomes impossible, then definitely move or definitely open your eyes if that's an uncomfortable uh, desire of opening the eyes comes up in you.
just has just as the heart has a natural tendency to beat the mind has a natural tendency to wander not judging the mind <clears throat> but accepting its wandering at the same time bringing it back very gently and kindly to where you want to focus it on It is completely natural to experience drowsiness, to experience exhaustion, to experience boredom. That's completely natural. If you notice that, just acknowledging that there is sleepiness, there is tiredness, there is boredom. And then again, coming back to what you're noticing, whether breath sensation, hands, feet, touch of your body on the surface. An important part of the practice is not to strive your practice to be one way or another, not to wish away any distractions that are coming and going, but just to observe them, letting go of them, not striving to be completely quiet and calm and peaceful. But if it happens, just acknowledging that. If it does not happen, Acknowledging and accepting that without judging. And in the final moments of this practice, doing a very brief gratitude practice towards yourself, which is offering gratitude to yourself for making time for your self-care, for being here and doing this practice to support yourself. And then focusing on the sound of this bell as it arises and passes as a way for us to transition from this practice to another. You're staying with the sound as long as it stays with you.
keeping your awareness, your mind with your body, whatever you're able to notice, whether breathing or any sensation, staying with that as we start, as we transition in, into this next practice. So we're going to do some movement meditation or mindful movement. Uh, before we begin that, I'll be offer I'll be offering some some movements and some guidelines right now. Self care is number one. Allowing yourself to do what you can, and there's no perfect way of doing this. You're using movement as a way of doing meditation. Yeah, it's not a competitive exercise regimen here. So taking care of yourself, not forcing yourself for any movement uh, that you cannot do or do not want to do, and also allowing yourself to either participate or opt out of this activity if it feels very overwhelming to you. However, giving yourself a chance with an open mind to try something that you may not have tried before, yeah? Finding this balance, this choice for yourself. Participation versus uh, if it's overwhelming to opt out of that, yeah? I'll continue to offer, I'll continue to offer guidelines as I offer this practice. If I'm inaudible at some point, please shout out to let me know if I know to project more, as I'll be stepping slightly further from my screen. Uh, if you're able to stand up, you can stand up, or if you want to do this by sitting down, you're also welcome to do this while sitting down. But just standing up in some space that may be around you. You don't have to be in front of the screen. You can be stepping aside as long as you're able to hear me. That should be sufficient. So just standing very comfortably in a very relaxed manner, the way that makes you feel comfortable and finding the ground beneath you and the way that ground is supporting you, feeling the touch of the surface on the soles of your feet. And if it's comfortable for you to close your eyes for the next few breaths, for the next few, few seconds, allowing yourself to close your eyes and to let your shoulders drop comfortably and just to notice your body expanding and contracting as you breathe. Noticing your body being supported by the floor. And then when you feel ready, widening your stance, your feet, just like shoulder width, width apart or slightly wider than your shoulders. And the invitation is to focus on your movement. Whenever you move, notice that my arm is moving. For example, now you're going to shift the weight of your body on your left foot. Yeah. And then lifting your left arm up very slowly and gradually while you notice the gravity acting on your arm as you raise it up. To notice the movement of your shoulder joint. And then allowing your fingers to kind of stretch up as if you are trying to reach out to grab something, a fruit, a low hanging fruit. And then wiggling your fingers to kind of feel this stretch all along your, your arm and perhaps all along your left side. As, of, as for your right hand, you can either rest it on your waist or let it dangle down. But to stretch your left hand just as high as you can comfortably. Now we are going for 60 to 70% of your capacity. You're not trying to stretch it like all the way, much more than you possibly can. But noticing the sensations on your, in your body, how are they different on the left side versus the right side? Taking this opportunity to rest your mind in the new sensations in your body, along, all along your left hand, all along um, the left side of your body, your left leg. And then slowly and gradually lowering your left hand and noticing the relaxation that your hand feels, any changing sensation that you're able to catch with your mind. And then taking a couple of breaths as a pause. And at the next, and next exhale, shifting the weight of your body on the right foot. 
and then gradually switching sides, lifting your right arm, slowly raising it up. And if you're able to close your eyes so that your mind is able to focus on your movement and the body sensations that arise, allowing yourself to close your eyes, but keeping them open if it helps your balance. And again, lifting your arm up, wiggling the fingers of your right hand to feel that stretch all along the forearm to the entire length of your arm. And placing your awareness, your attention in any stretch, any gentle pain that you might feel due to this movement. And holding this posture for a few breaths, two, three, maybe four breaths as a measure. And being very intentional, gradual and slow in bringing your right arm down while noticing the movement of your shoulder, movement of your arm, any relaxation that you may feel as your arm comes down. And resting in the standing posture for one full breath, one inhale, one exhale. And then resting your hands on your waist, whether you're sitting down, whether you're standing up. And preparing for some neck rolls. You can do this with closed eyes or with open eyes. So gently lowering your chin, pointing it towards your chest and noticing the lowering of your head, the weight of your head that you may be able to notice. And then rolling your neck very slowly and gently, being very careful, taking care to not force yourself, rolling it towards your right shoulder, noticing any urge to rush and allowing yourself to slow down and rolling your head behind and noticing the dynamic changing sensations around your neck, around your shoulders during this movement. Rolling your head towards your left shoulder and gradually bringing it back to the center and repeating for two more rotations in this direction at your own play or at your own pace. If the mind wanders to any thoughts, bringing it back to your movement and the body sensations. And as you return back to the center, switching directions, now rolling your head towards your left shoulder and remembering to notice the motion, noticing any changing sensations around your neck, around your shoulders. So, and rolling your head towards your right shoulder now, gradually returning back to the center and repeating twice more. And when you're ready, lifting your head gradually up, allowing your hands to comfortably rest on your sides, closing your eyes for the next few breaths and taking stock, noticing what has changed in the sensations of your body, around the shoulders, around the neck, around your legs, the back, the waist. Just noticing what sensations are most noticeable by your mind?
and then allowing the sound of this bell to bring you back to a comfortable sitting posture. Thank you all for engaging and participating in this. Um, this is a couple of the many techniques that we use in this program, along with uh, the didactic session of the stress reduction and the physiology of that, the neuroscience that I talked about. And participation, uh, discussion is a huge element of that, discussion of your direct experience, which we'll jump into now.